And welcome to our program, Perfecting Me, Becoming More Like Jesus. I'm so glad you've joined us. My guests today on our program are Ruthie Jacobson, Head of Prayer Ministry of the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists, Pastor Errol Stoddard, Senior Pastor of the Church of the Oranges of Seventh-day Adventists in Orange, New Jersey, and Mrs. Adley Campos, Speaker and President of Family Wellbeing International. You'll hear from them a little later. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, Antonio Stradivari built the most extraordinary violins. The beauty and clarity of the sound are legendary. In 2010, centuries later, one of his violins sold for $16 million. As he labored in his studio, Stradivari had one rule. No violin was to leave the shop until it was as close to perfection as humanly possible. He is known to have said, God needs violins to send his music into the world. And if my violins are defective, God's music will be spoiled. I believe the lives we live are God's music to the world. And in order for the music to be as beautiful as possible, our lives must be emptied of all that is unlike the character of God. Our lives must be in tune with the beauty of holiness. If you are like me, you probably view becoming more like God and developing his character as both exciting and daunting, noble and intimidating, a great dream and some think impossible. It has taken me many years to understand that to become a follower of Jesus means to live as he lived. And no matter how overwhelming the thought, to accomplish that goal, I had to embrace the pursuit of divine perfection and the character of God as my life's primary goal. I began to see the pursuit of divine perfection as fundamental to my character development and spiritual progress. This is what our program is all about today, Perfecting Me. Because of sin, for the last 6,000 years, true perfection, inherent, innate, natural-born perfection, has not been available to us. The Bible says we were born in sin and shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. On this side of the fall of Adam and Eve, there has never been true inborn, inbred perfection. Sin and iniquity has been a visitor to our fathers and children unto the third and fourth generation. When the forbidden fruit was eaten in disobedience, perfection for man died and sin began its reign. And since that day, no man has been able to claim true perfection. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Today, mankind lives in a swamp of imperfection. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If that be true, how is it then that the word of God calls some imperfect men of God perfect? Genesis 6, 9, the Bible says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. The book of Job, chapter 1, verse 1 says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. How could this be? I believe it is because God has a very different view of perfection than we do. You see, there are other definitions of perfection than the one we subscribe to usually. They are definitions of perfection, like I believe God embraces I believe he applies to the human condition. These are definitions of perfection 
that are full of grace, full of mercy. The first definition of perfection we need to understand is the definition that sees something perfect that is as free of flaws and defects as much as possible. I'm a singer and I can tell you every singer in every song makes mistakes. But the great ones make a stumble look like a pirouette. I want you to know the very best we can and the very best we know how, God sees us doing that and says, perfect. Yes, God sees our trying sincerely to be perfect. And he gives us a perfect grade for trying to be perfect. <laughs> Have you ever had a teacher give you a poor grade but an A for effort? Well, God sees us doing the best we know how, and God says, perfect. A for effort. The servant of the Lord says, we are to bring glory to God by doing our best to be perfect men and perfect women. Christ looks at the spirit and when he sees us carrying our burden with faith, his perfect holiness atones for our shortcomings. And when we do our best, he becomes our righteousness. He becomes our perfection. Wow, what a God. As we do our best, the blessing of God will rest upon us Shall we not arise, says the servant of God, and build? Many believe because Jesus paid it all, we are not required to do anything at all. And because our mistakes are covered, we don't have to stress ourselves about repeating those mistakes occasionally or maybe regularly or even frequently. And we console ourselves with that mantra, ah, nobody's perfect. The truest perfection man will ever know is not determined by his personal achievements, but rather by his possession of the virtues of Christ, like simplicity, humility, and joyful obedience to the will of God. So God sees that as being perfect, as he is perfect. God reckons our sincere efforts to be like the Father and the Son, and he says, perfect. God is pleased with men who do not think that they have attained perfection, but who are constantly trying to improve. And he would have us come into connection with himself and increase in understanding he wants us to reform our habits, always rising higher and approaching nearer the standard of perfection. And so if we do our best, it is all the Lord requires. He will give us the strength to do our best and we can resist temptation, not in our own strength, but in his strength. Let every one of us ask ourselves, am I a genuine Christian? Am I doing my very best to perfect a character after the divine model? I want you to see a video of a man doing the best he can for the Lord, courtesy of our friends from CBN News. comes as naturally as breathing for 58-year-old blues musician Daryl Davis. Well, I've been playing uh, music professionally full-time since 1980 when I graduated college at the age of 22. Through music, Davis has formed some unique friendships. That's Sam Phillips, the man who discovered Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, the boxer Joe Frazier, Dolly Parton. And also unlikely ones. 
And uh, that's uh, that was the head of the uh, Maryland Ku Klux Klan. How did you get to be friends with members of the KKK? I just happened to be, in 1983, uh, country music had made a resurgence in this country. So I was the only black guy in this country band, and consequently, the only black guy in many of the places where we played. One place was the Silver Dollar Lounge in Frederick, Maryland. After a performance, a white man stopped Davis as he walked off the stage. And he says, you know, I, I really like your all's music. And I said, thank you. I shook his hand, and I don't drink, but I went back to his table, and I had a cranberry juice with him. <laughs> and then he makes the remark, when the waitress brings my cranberry juice, he clinks my glass and cheers me. And he says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. Well, now I'm thinking, wow, yeah, what's going on here? You know, this guy's really having a, a night of first. And I said, um, why? And, and again, I was, I was naive, and I wasn't trying to be facetious. And I said, well, why is that? He stared at the tabletop and didn't answer me. And he had a, a, a friend sitting next to him. He goes, tell him, tell him, tell him. I said, tell me. And finally he says, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Since age 10, when first confronted with the realities of racism, Davis pondered one question. How can you hate me when you don't know me? His unlikely KKK connection inspired him to start getting answers. Some years later, um, well, I decided I was going to, to write a book on the Klan. His research often put him in some dangerous situations, but it also led to an unexpected change in the relationship he shared with certain Klan members. I would ask them questions, and they would answer the questions, but they wouldn't ask for my opinion. And then over time, you know, uh, I would say, so what do you think about blah, blah, blah? And they would say, well, I think da, 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 da. And, I, and then they would say, well, what do you think about it, Daryl? Oh, wait a minute. All of a sudden, I have value? Davis says he's convinced 25 members of the Ku Klux Klan to leave the organization simply through friendly conversation. And when they did so, they gave me their robes and hoods. That's just not done. You know, th this uniform represents white supremacy. And you're taking it off and giving it to a black man? As a new generation of African Americans enter adulthood, they're fighting racism their own way. Rather than trying to change one mind at a time, as Davis has done, this activist generation is using social media to reach the masses. Some in the Black Lives Matter movement have been critical of Davis, saying he's defeating their purpose with his relational approach. The fact that I would sit down and, and spend so much time with the enemy when I should be devoting my time to changing the system of white supremacy. Davis believes this younger generation has the right intent, although their methods can taint the mission. You need a multi-prong attack from the front, from the side, from the back, from the rear window, whatever. You don't change the system without changing the people behind the system. Okay? That's why I'm sitting down with them, and I've had success. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Baltimore, Maryland. Joining us again are my guests, Ruthie Jacobson, Adley Campos, and Pastor Errol Stoddard. I want to tell you all about one of the most amazing moments I've ever had in my life. Uh, I spent two hours riding in a car from London, England to Oxford with a gentleman by the name of Dr. John Stott. Uh, if you've never heard that name, he's one of, one of the great preachers and theologians of our time. As a matter of fact, uh, he used to be the chaplain to the Queen of England from 1959 to 1992. Uh, you, you, that's quite a long run to, to be the chaplain of the Queen of England. Well, before he died, he preached his last sermon and he said, after all my teaching, after all my writing, all the books are published, I leave you with one recommendation, one thing I must recommend to you, he said, it's Christ-likeness. And then he said these words, Christ-likeness is the will of God for the people of God. And so I want to start off mm -hmm. by asking you, uh, Pastor Stoddard, uh, when we pursue Christ-likeness, we're pursuing perfection. But let me ask you, how important do you think it is for the church of God to begin to focus on Christ-likeness as the will of God for the people of God? 
I, I think it's very, very important. I think it's absolutely important. Uh, one, of the, one of the popular terms uh, uh, we hear today is, is the term secular Christianity, which is an oxymoron. Mm. It's Christianity that's trying to be as, uh, uh, have as least of Christ as possible, oh or to act uh, as on Christ like as, <laughs> as possible while still being called a Christian. Yeah. It's the minimalist mindset of Christianity. Yeah. Christianity at the bare minimum. Yeah. And what God is calling us to is Christianity that's absolute surrender. Yeah. The song says, all to Jesus I surrender. My fear is that there are so many Christians who are singing, some to Jesus I surrender, yeah. I surrender some. Yeah. And there's no such thing as some. Right. It's all or nothing. Yes. Ruthie, how important is Christ's likeness to the people of God? And, and we have not always had that as our primary focus. Uh, do you think it's important to reclaim Christ's likeness as the focus for God's people? Well, absolutely. And I think it was important to Christ because he taught his followers to abide in him. Yes. He said, if you want to be like me, abide in the vine because you have no life without that. So he, he drew from nature. He showed lots of different, in different ways, stories and parables. But the whole thing boils down to being like Christ and abiding in the vine, taking that life from the vine out to the branches and then being useful and bearing fruit. Yes. Now, and I don't think the church can bear fruit without the Christ likeness. Yes. Go ahead, Adley. Yes. Um, I'm thinking on the moment before Jesus' ascension to heaven yes. as he gave us the mission. And in his mission, he said that we were to preach by testimony. Yes. In order to take his gospel to all the earth. Yes. So it is absolutely important that we take that seriously and talk about it and begin to live exactly like he wants us to live in order to be that testimony and preach not only by word, but most of all, by the way we live, the way we represent Christ on this earth. I'm wondering, uh, what are some of the things you think the church has often placed ahead of Christ likeness? Uh, what are some of the priorities <laughs> that our organizations and uh, what are some of the efforts you think we have put? I'm trying to be diplomatic and nice, but maybe you don't have to be. But uh, what are some of the things, Pastor Stardy, do you think the church has and you notice I went to you first, which is great, which is great. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what are some of the things that we often put ahead of Christ likeness? Well, you know, I, the unique thing about being a Seventh Day Adventist is that uh, we are we are doctrinally heavy. We are mm -hmm. heavy on doctrine mm -hmm. because our doctrines are the unique features that separate us, that set us apart from everybody else. Yes. And the challenge is that uh, while it is important to emphasize doctrine, yes. uh, many times we emphasize doctrine at the expense of transformation into the character of Christ. Yes. And that is something that is important uh, for us to ensure that we're making that shift back to keeping the main thing the main thing. Yes. It is the character of Christ first it is godliness first. It is receiving him and reflecting him first, and then the rest of it coming at the secondary level. Beautiful. Ruthie, you know, uh, go ahead. Hey. You're going to say something. What were you going to ask? Me? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I was just introducing uh, and following on what he said, uh, the idea that the servant of God says that the last message that will be given to the world is the message about Christ's character and the loving character of God. Yeah. Now, we don't often teach that. <laughs> we, we, we think it's another message. Maybe it's a prophetic message. And sometimes uh, I, I tell people, what does it matter if you know the details of prophecy, but in your character, you're not prepared 
for the fulfillment of prophecy. So as important, wow. as important, important as prophecy is, it, it has to take a back seat to us resembling, reflecting, and revealing the character of Christ. Because there, sadly, right. there are gonna be a lot of people when the Lord comes who know a lot about prophecy who don't look like him in character. Uh, but Ruthie, what were you gonna share? Well, I was just gonna say, he has already told us what his response is going to be. He'll say, I don't know you. Yes. And I think, I think in our churches today, the temptation is uh, we need more programs, we need more sophisticated uh, yeah. technology, yeah. we need more funds, mm -hmm. we need more resources, when really what we need is Christ. Yeah. We need prayer, mm -hmm. we need to be on our faces before him, yeah. realizing that we have power only in one place. But you know, Ruth We cannot do this. Yeah, I was gonna say- Who are we trying to kid? We need God. Absolutely. You know, I was going to say, Ruthie, that uh, we always say, and you hear it all, all, all over, we need Jesus. We need Christ. And, and I hear that a lot in, in our churches, but we don't break that down to really interpret what that means. And what it really means is we need people who reflect Christ, as Pastor Stoddard said. We need people who yeah. resemble him. We, we, yes, we, we need Christ, but Christ has to be seen in us. Uh, Sister Campos. In control. Go ahead, Ruthie. I was just going to say, I've heard you say more than once, I bury a lot of mean people. <laughs> and yes. I, don't, I don't think you would have to do that yeah. if these people knew the Lord, were yeah. walking in the light, yes. and were sharing his love. Uh, I think people would be uh, really missing them and realizing that here we lost someone who loved Christ and right. was and Christ was in control. Uh, Sister Campos, you had a thought on that. Uh, on uh, You can share. Yes, I agree with Ruthie that we are concentrating too much in, on entertainment. Wow. The type of worship service that everybody yeah. wants and trying to please everyone else rather than to think what pleases our God in our worship service in my person as I worship him, as I try to imitate him in, instead of imitating the world and bringing the world into our church. You, you know, one of the things the Lord showed me was that the most fiery, red hot, blistering sermon Jesus ever preached was not to confirmed sinners, but to the most devout religious people of his day, uh, the Pharisees. Yes. He called them, uh, right. you know, graves full of dead men's bones. And, uh, and I was wondering why was Jesus so hard on them? Because they were actually the evangelists of their day. A lot of people don't know that. That was the, the role of the Pharisees. The role of the Pharisees was to study scriptures with people, baptize them, by immersion, the Pharisees, and when you came up out of the water, you were a new Jew. And uh, Jesus said of them, you go to the ends of the earth to make these new members, to these new proselytes. But when you're through with them, they're twice the child of hell that you are. <laughs> Those were the words of Jesus. Yeah. And but what the right. Lord showed me, what Jesus was saying is, when you're through with them, they look more like you than they look like me. Wow, yeah. And, yeah. and and that is what God is looking for. When he looks at us, he's looking for people who look like his son. And that's what Jesus Amen. is looking for. And uh, what, what here, else, here, go ahead, here, go ahead. Here, here's the challenge, Mintley. I think, I think as a pastor, and I'm at ground zero. Yes. Uh, I have about a thousand members in my church. Mm -hmm. And you, you get the spectrum of people, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes. Uh, the, the challenge is that a lot of times, because of our doctrinal emphasis, because of our theological emphasis, as opposed to a transformational emphasis, right. people believe that conversion is about knowledge, how much information I have, because right. I have a certain amount of information. Right. It automatically suggests that I'm converted. When really conversion 
uh, and following Jesus and being a disciple of Christ and reflecting his character is going to involve, number one, speaking his word. Yes. We have number just 10 two, seconds. Yes. Acting like him. Speaking, acting. Uh -huh. And number three, treating people the way he would treat them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You've been such a blessing yeah. today. Thank you for being with us. God the Father is our true standard of perfection. God alone is our standard of perfection. He is our pattern, our model, the yardstick by which we measure true perfection. All perfection is found only in him. Our Father is perfect. And there is no real perfection apart from him. The only true perfection we have comes from the Father and through his Son, Jesus. Too many see this word perfection as incompatible with God's grace and mercy, and we fail to see that that word perfection is precisely why God gave us grace and mercy, so that the perfection heaven demands and the perfection we do not now possess may be miraculously aligned and reconciled. Today, the pendulum has swung to the other extreme. Many believe because Jesus paid it all, we are not required to do anything at all. And because our mistakes are covered, we don't have to stress ourselves about repeating the same mistakes regularly or even frequently. But I believe as we surrender to Christ, he gives us his perfection. I'm Wintley Phipps. I hope you've enjoyed this program today. And remember, to be a Christian means to be Christ-like. All day, every day, no excuses.